Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Leveraging Recent Advances in Miltigny Cell Sorting Automation Platforms to Reduce Time to Data in Primary Cell-Based Assays, presented by Dr. Nick Trotter-Mayo, Global Key Account Manager, Pharma, Miltigny Biotech. I'm Julie Simroth of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Miltigny Biotech. For more information about our sponsor, visit MiltignyBiotech.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. For questions not answered today, we will follow up with participants via email. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the icon located on the lower right of the screen. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Trotter Mayo. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thanks, Julie. Um, as Julie mentioned, I'm Nick Trotter Mayo. Uh, I'm part of the Global Key Account team, uh, which pretty much means I work with a bunch of our different biopharmaceutical companies companies working on different uh, platforms and assays to help them you know, advance their research. And I just want to tell you about a couple of the things we've been doing with some different uh, groups um, and some new platforms we developed that really enhance our ability to automate cell sorting and to reduce some time that it takes to uh, generate data in primary cell-based assays. So um, just moving forward, uh, Miltini is a, a global leader in the life sciences and cell therapy industry. Um, the company itself is independently owned, so it's privately held. Uh, we've been in business about 27 years. Um, we've grown to be about 1,800 employees with more than 400 people in R&D and engineering. And those 400 people are really the heart of the company and enable us to be vertically integrated for um, production of instruments, consumables, and biological products. So pretty much everything we'll talk about today, Miltenny manufactures itself. Um, and because we have a pretty big R&D group and engineering group, we have a real history of advancing both basic and translational research. And for us, translational research is really referring to our work in the cell therapy industry. So we have global operations across 25 countries. Um, and uh, this is kind of a global map from Altenia of where we are. So where you see these little purple triangles are where we have um, actual business locations or, or subsidiaries in 25 different countries. Um, the company itself is German. It has two major sites in Germany. Uh, the first is in British Gladbach, which is right outside Cologne. This is our global headquarters where most of our R&D is done in, in uh, product production, but we also have a facility in Tetero, which manufactures GMP products, which are sort of our regulated products for cell therapy use. And in the U.S., we've seen a pretty big expansion of our footprint in the U.S. with now having six sites, including some R&D and engineering going on in the U.S. So, uh, Miltenny is, is really known for uh, its magnetic bead platforms and uh, sorting cells using magnetic beads, and that's certainly what we'll spend a lot of the time today talking about. But when I think about our company, what I think we've really developed in the last 27 years is really world-class expertise in cell processing. And um, really what we've been advancing in the last five to 10 years is, is increasingly generating these integrated and automated workflows for um, ex vivo cell processing. So taking blood or tissue from a patient or an animal model and really putting it through a, an optimized procedure so that um, we have the best possible cell product at the end of that for whatever the downstream endpoint assay is. And those um, different categories break down along a couple of different lines. So we have sample preparation, which is our general max platforms, which enable the ability to um, generate single cell suspensions. And then the cell separation platforms, which are our magnetic B platforms. And again, we'll talk about that quite a bit today. And then in the cell culture space, for primary cell culture, we have a bunch of different technologies for activation, expansion, transduction, 
uh, specific medias and other things that allow us to culture cells. And then finally, cell analysis, we'll talk about a little bit at the end of my talk, which is our flow portfolios, which include instrumentation and reagents, and also now a flow sorter of the macrophytes. So that's kind of a basic introduction to us as a company. For today, um, what I'd like to achieve um, with this presentation is to uh, really have five sections. The first is just to give you a basic introduction to the magnetic V technology or what we call MAX technology. Um, and this is the technology we'll use in the next couple of sections when we talk about specific new uh, instrumentation and technologies and how we've been leveraging them with uh, our customers. And then um, we'll kind of talk about two central themes of, of what are some real key challenges that we've been working with customers on who are using primary cell-based assays um, and the problems they've been having and how we've helped solve them by working with them. And so um, you can kind of guess probably what those two challenges are based on these next couple sections, but really it's um, discussing strategies for the effective handling of really large cell numbers. So having a, a single product that has a lot of cells in it, so billions of cells or tens of billions of cells. Um, and this is this idea of working at whole Nucapac scale, and we'll certainly talk about that in more detail and help you understand what that means. Uh, and then give you some specific examples as well of uh, cell types we've used. And then kind of switching gears is really, now I'm talking about having a single sample that's too large to be processed, but uh, having too many samples to, to effectively process in a given unit of time. So the idea of multiplexing cell sorting and working in a high throughput environment, and this could certainly be uh, lots of patient samples, like small volumes of blood that are coming in that need to be processed to purify cells. Or the example we'll use is actually a mouse tumor model uh, where we're looking at enriching the uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes um, before immunophenotyping. And so we'll kind of use that as a case study. And then finally, in just a few slides, we'll return to this idea of cell analysis and um, extending uh, the analysis of those isolated primary cell populations by using 384 well photometry. photometry. Um, and this is introduction to a new instrument that Milton has just released called the MaxQuant X, which enables this 384 uh, well plate-based uh, flow cytometry. And then kind of in the final slide, just talk about how using 384 well flow can make primary cell, uh, particularly screening activities, more realistic because of miniaturization of the assay. Um, and then I'll take some questions. So um, just taking the first point there, the introduction to Max technology, which is the technology we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about. We use, um, uh, Miltenny uh, uses a nano-sized uh, magnetic bead. So this is a 50 nanometer particle. It's composed of iron, uh, protein, and sugar. So it's completely biodegradable, and it's, it's really, really small. Um, and in addition to that, you can see that um, there's a CD8 T cell here on the upper right hand um, here that you can see. And basically, they've, they've labeled it here with um, uh, some uh, microbeads and then looked at it by scanning electron microscopy. And you can see really at the magnification of the cell, we really can't see the beads. They're just too small uh, to be seen. Um, and then we use a, a column-based uh, system to uh, enrich cells labeled with these uh, magnetic beads and a separator, which is really the magnet. And we'll spend some time talking more about the uh, uh, columns and the magnets. But the technology itself can be used for positive isolation of, of a specific population. Um, depletion of unwanted cells, um, so just depleting a single population, or untouched isolation, which means depleting all the non-target cells um, and allowing uh, the, the target population to essentially flow through the column. So unlike some other commercial systems out there, Max uses columns, and often it's not clear to our customers and others why we use columns. And it really goes back to the size of the magnetic particles. So if you remember, we have this little 50 nanometer piece of iron that is coupled to a monoclonal antibody. And if you calculate the force you need to catch that little tiny particle, it's a really big magnetic field. And so um, to successfully do this, um, we use a column. And this column has this steel ball matrix. And the steel ball matrix is, is bending the magnetic field lines um, around the um, uh, uh, the steel balls and amplifying the field. And it's increasing the density of those lines, which is shown here where I'm drawing this arrow. Um, and you can see that there are increasing number of magnetic fields uh, lines in there. And where that um, field is highest is where um, the cells will actually arrest, which are these little purple cells that are inside um, uh, this right uh, figure. And so 
uh, where the field is weaker, we have washing of non-target cells through the column. And so by using this column, it allows us to use a really small particle and successfully sort the cells. So um, we do this by really minimal labeling. Um, and then the column itself is coded with a, a cell-friendly sort of hydrophilic uh, uh, coating. And so things can wash through it. And so we get effective removal of debris and contaminants. And so uh, the, the outcome of using columns and these really small beads is that they enable cell separation, including positive selection, with a really minimal effect on cells versus other sort of magnetic bead technology. When we actually look at just doing a sort. It's really straightforward. So we have a magnetic labeling step, which is just putting the bead particle on the target population. And this left graph over here, um, where I'm drawing the arrow, we're doing a positive selection uh, of the cell. Uh, and so we're labeling the cell that we want to sort. And so the idea is this purple cell where I drew the arrow has a uh, differentially expressed antigen, something like CD4 on a T cell that we can label with this, this bead particle. And now once we've labeled the population, we put the column in the magnetic field, we get this high gradient magnetic field introduced. We pass the, the single cell suspension through the column. Again, all those non-target cells are flowing through um, uh, the column and into the negative fraction, which is here where I'm drawing this arrow now. And then finally, we remove the column from the magnetic field and a loop. Um, and this gives us uh, highly pure cells uh, in a really rapid fashion. And this technology has been widely used over the last 27 years. It's been thousands and thousands of publications and it really has developed as a being a gold standard for both research and clinical based cell sorting. So that's kind of a basic introduction to Max technology. And really what we're gonna talk about in the next section is, is how to apply that. And there are a lot of different ways that you can uh, use this same technology um, and interact with it. So in those 27 years, we've made a bunch of different hardware. And so this just gives you a basic breakdown on our different types of hardware that you can use to sort cells. So we have manual hardware, uh, which these are widely available. And if you kind of walk around your lab where you, where you do research, you'll probably see some of these hanging out. Um, and these are just manual based systems with, with columns and magnets where you're doing all the pipetting work yourself, so there's really no automation. We've expanded the manual hardware in the last few years to make it uh, higher throughput and more multiplexed so that we can run up to 24 samples at a time with this instrument, the Multimax L24 Plus. And then for automated hardware options, we have this Automax Pro, which has been our standard offering for an automated instrument. The Automax is kind of a workhorse system for us, and it, but it will only run between one and six samples. And its scale versus some newer platforms is somewhat limited when we talk about total cell number. So we've expanded our capabilities and the automated space by adding uh, essentially two new instruments. One is the Multimax X, which is an instrument we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about, which is the automated version of the Multimax L24 Plus. This really offers a speed. Uh, versus uh, the other platforms like the Automax Pro, it's really much faster because now we're working in a multiplex format. And then this other instrument, the Clinimax Prodigy, um, is really uh, was a was developed to do clinical cell sorting and large scale clinical sorts for cell therapy work, but it's been applied by our research customers because it really offers an expansion of scale so that so, uh, researchers can sort more cells in a given unit of time and start with larger cell products. And so these two platforms have really um, expanded our ability in, in the automation space versus what was previously capable with just the Automax Pro. So um, kind of coming back to the, the idea of, of what are the challenges that when we work with customers in the sort of biopharmaceutical space, what are they really facing? What are they coming to us that you know, is, is making their work difficult? Um, when they start thinking about doing primary cell-based assays. So a lot of these drug screens and other things used to be done more with tissue culture cells, and now they're increasingly be done with primary cell models, and that creates some challenges. So there are really two challenges we'll talk about today and how we've addressed them with two different platforms. The first one of those is a scale-based challenge, and this really just means that performing the assay or the screen that these researchers need to do requires billions of primary cells. And because of the cell number that they need, the scale is really difficult to achieve with current platforms, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, then there are throughput challenges where there are essentially just too many samples to process using given resources or the available time. Um, uh, so that the throughput is just not able to be achieved um, easily. And so we'll, we'll talk about each of these in a couple of different ways and how we, we solve these with different platforms. 
Um, when we look at the first challenge, just comparisons uh, of scale between common story technologies. So there are historic story technologies like close photometry and Max that have been used for a really long time. This is essentially just a logarithmic graph, um, a piece of logarithmic graph paper where you can plot between 100,000 cells and 100 billion cells on the far end here, so on the right side. And so your cell number is increasing in millions as we go uh, along the x-axis here. And if we just kind of plot different technologies, flow-based sorting, which probably is occurring at 30,000 events per second or less, you can easily do sorts of up to 200 million cells um, in a given unit of time. Um, you could do more, but now you're starting to have longer sorts and sometimes cell viability can become a major issue. And so really what we're, we're focused on uh, is what's kind of easily to do here. Max had a more uh, expanded capacity for cell processing of really going up to a billion cells. Um, but once we got north of a billion cells with existing platforms, we really started to struggle with the number of cells we had. And with some of these primary cell assays where we need a billion purified cells, starting with a billion total cells really isn't enough uh, throughput or enough uh, scale. So that's really when many of our research customers started looking for solutions and they sort of hit upon uh, with our help that this Clinomax Prodigy system can really expand the scales that we can do. So the Clinomax Prodigy can really uh, process up to about 60 billion cells per run. And the really key thing here is that it exists in sort of this scale where people who work with commercial Leucopax work. And we'll explain more about what the Leucopax are and, and the scale of these, these things, but essentially it's around 10 billion cells is kind of the key number that we really want to be working out with a lot of these large scale primary cell assays because that's the uh, starting material that's available. And so none of these other two technologies, flow sorting or mat, traditional MACs, really are able to extend out to that sort of scale, that desired scale that's really required to do these sorts. So the second challenge, and just kind of investigating now a little bit further, is just looking at uh, basically just taking one of our platforms. So the, uh, this is my little cartoon of an Automax Pro that we introduced to you earlier, which is our kind of standard automated cell sorter. Um, many people have assays now where they're getting 20, 30, 40 samples at a time. This can be clinical samples, they can be samples from mice. Um, we'll talk later about tumors uh, and how those create some real challenges. But essentially, um, we would set up and run the Automax uh, for four runs to do 24 samples because we can only program six events, six samples per run. And the Automax works uh, sequentially through samples, so it's only processing one sample at a time. And so it takes 10 minutes per sample, which is a reasonable time for these sorts to occur. And you had 24 samples. Essentially, that works out to being four hours of sort time. If you had prep steps before these four hours to start, so maybe an hour or two of prep work to get tissues out of mice or other things, and then you had a four-hour run, um, or you're very late in your working day before you're actually setting up your final assays or other things. So many customers we've worked with have seen that the Automax systems are, just aren't fast enough and the Automaxes are generally faster than flow sorting individual samples, so flow is not really an option either. So there was a real gap uh, in, in the needs of, of sort of the market space for, for higher throughput cell sorting technology. Okay, so that's kind of the two key uh, problems that are facing the um, uh, field. And then we'll really talk about a couple, each of those problems and how we've addressed them. And so in this next section, we're gonna kind of revisit that first problem of the scale-based problem and really talk about strategies for effective handling of large cell numbers or large starting numbers of cells before we do cell sorting. And we'll introduce the idea of what is Leucopax scale sorting, and then we'll give you an introduction to the Clinomax Prodigy system. What is it? How does it work? And then we'll take kind of two case studies where we look at um, the isolation of human regulatory T cells, which is a rare cell example, and then some automated generation of a monocyte, monocyte derived dendritic cells. Um, to show you the full capabilities of the system. So when people are wanting to scale up work with primary human immune cells, the natural place to go is to leukopheresis products. So leukopheresis products are essentially, uh, the, the donor is connected to an instrument that um, removes preferentially certain white cell populations. They are generally enriched for monocytes and lymphocytes and our low and granulocytes sites and RBCs. And so we get, and the scale of these products is usually about eight to 12 billion cells, but they can be more. Um, so the scale creates problems because we have so many cells to process when, when the pack comes in. 
But the great thing is, is that if we can effectively process that, we can get lots of purified cells um, from a single donor um, that can be cryopreserved and used across the whole screen or can, can be consumed all at once. So it creates a lot of flexibility for researchers if they can effectively process leukopax um, and for um, these immune cell assays, essentially. Um, and it's even more valuable in the rare cell space where we really need a lot of starting populations of cells just to get enough uh, cell number to um, do any assays at all. Okay, so that's just kind of a basic introduction to leukopax. So again, the key thing here is that they're really big cell products of about 10 billion total cells um, that, that are, and those 10 billion cells are essentially similar to PPMC. Okay, so the, the Prodigy offers fully automated uh, leukopax sorting. Okay, so we'll talk more about the specific features and capabilities, but really the key idea here is, is that you connect your leukopax to the system along with all the other required reagents uh, and this tubing set. And then in a single four hour run that's fully automated, um, the Prodigy can fight call the sample. So it has onboard centrifugation capabilities to do these density gradient centrifugations. And then it takes that sort of PBMC sample and then it will magnetically sort the population using magnetic beads from mill penning. And it can use any of our research technology beads. So lots of different, uh, different types of cells, T cells, B cells, monocytes, DCs, all these different cell types can be sorted on the Prodigy. And then after the cells are sorted, um, because it has onboard centrifugation and the ability to wash cells, it can formulate the final product in a suitable volume for a downstream assay. And it can process up to this key number of a whole loop pack. And uh, it's, we'll, we'll kind of ex uh, look at this in comparison to other technologies in a little bit like the Automax and the timing, but it's really, really much, much faster to use this instrument versus other technologies that are in the market. And, the reason the Prodigy can run these fully automated assays is that it takes all the sort of uh, manual devices or lab devices that you would need or functions you would need and, and integrates it into a single platform. So we have magnetic cell sorting, so we have a max selection system built in. And really the key thing is we have centrifugation on board. So the ability to automate centrifugation opens up uh, really a, a lot of different uh, complex assays and samples because we can always wash samples. We can um, uh, when, uh, we can wash them, we can do density gradient, um, we can exchange buffers, all these types of things that um, are really hard to do with automation. So automating centrifugation is a really challenging thing to do. The tubing set that we install, and we'll talk more about this tubing set, because there's uh, a lot of people who work with uh, research samples and haven't worked with Incompax aren't real comfortable with working in bags or other things and these tubing sets. Um, but the tubing set also offers biosafety containment without a, an external because the, the entire process is run in bags and it's um, kept away from the operator. And then we don't need uh, the tissue culturing to be in the microscope just to purify cells, but in the MoDC example, we'll also show you how the system can do automated cell culture and expansion of cells and has a microscope for their QC. So really when you look at all these functions put together, the Prodigy can really be performed to run virtually any cell washing, cell purification or expansion process and give you the cells that you want, these primary cells, and exactly the final formalization you desire. So we can really program a Prodigy to do just about anything, uh, no matter the complexity given its capabilities. So if we look at the instrument and just its kind of basic features, um, and I'll kind of work from the touch screen on the right uh, and around uh, in a clockwise fashion through these. Um, so the touch screen is how you interact with the screen, the system. Um, the, it has a graphical user interface that, that's really straightforward to uh, get the system up and running a given program. And there's a magnetic separation unit built in on the right hand side. And then there's this tube sealer and barcode reader. The tube sealer allows you to seal tubes. So when uh, you're done with your cell selection and you want to take your target cells off the instrument, you can uh, just crimp the tubing uh, and break it and the cells are contained in a sterile bag. Barcode reader lets you track lot numbers and other things. There's a bag compartment here at the bottom. That's essentially where your target cells go and, and your non-target cells are waste. It's just a place where the different bags are placed and, and held. Then we have this really key feature, the centricult unit. This is the centrifugation system. So um, what it allows us to do density gradients and cell washing, but it's also the cultivation unit. So inside the same chamber that we would spend the cells to do, density gradient, they can also be cultivated in that chamber. And then we have a peristaltic pump, liquid sensors, and pinch valves, which 
control uh, the fluidics of the system and the flow of buffer uh, around all the different tubes in the tubing set. And then finally, we have a gas mix unit because if we want to do soil cultivation, we need to be able to control the gas mix. Um, so you can hook up you know, external carbon dioxide, oxygen sources, these types of things, and control uh, the cultivation environments within the central call in unit. And then finally, you have these bag hangers, which is, and it holds all your reagents, uh, buffers, media, bags, all these different things go on the top of the unit. So that's just kind of a quick overview. So uh, many people are intimidated by the prodigy, uh, and most of the intimidation comes around the idea of, of handling in bags. So I certainly, in my scientific career, had never handled in bags and found it kind of overwhelming. But when you're working with very large cell products, it's actually advantageous to, to keep things in bags because now we can use large volumes of buffer. We don't have a million tubes uh, running around the lab um, trying to find enough centrifugation space for them um, or things like that. Um, we just keep everything in bags and everything sterile. And the Luca pack itself comes in a bag, and so it can be just directly connected onto the tubing set along with the buffers and everything going along with the agent. So um, the other thing is the, the tubing set looks really complex. Um, and this slide is really talking about that it, it, it is complex in terms of its design, but it's not hard to install because it has this um, mounting aid. So it comes on a blue plastic sheet, and you hang that over the pinch valves of the system. And essentially, that aligns the different tubing lines directly with the valve that they're going to go through. And then there, when you're installing the tubing set, there's also, via the graphical user interface on the screen, there's an installation guide. So it's walking you through step by step how you install the tubing set. So anybody can learn to do this. It's not complicated at all. It just takes some time. So you're going to budget about 30 minutes in the morning if you want to run a Prodigy to do a, a cell sort to, to get your product connected, your reagents connected, and your tubing set on the instrument. Um, but then the rest of the process is really automated, so you're not having to interact with the system. So Hopefully that uh, makes the, the tubing set and the usage bags a little less uh, fearful for you. Um, so um, the really key feature again is the centrical unit. Um, it's it's a really brilliant idea. So. It's degraded with Baikal as it would be done in the tube. And then the cells are spun in 3D space, and essentially they layer just as they would in a tube. Um, and you can see uh, here where I'm, I'm drawing this arrow, uh, in this window you can see that layering effect. So we have on the inside, uh, the least dense material is the plasma and buffer, and then we have this small white ring that is leukocytes, and then on the outside we have the erythrocytes and granocytes from the product. So if you've done a FICOL manually, um, you get the same three layers that you would uh, with that. Um, but we can also do cell washing uh, and concentration steps, so it doesn't always have to be a fight call. We can just spin the cells to the outer wall in buffer and then remove the inner wall of buffer. And the way this all works is essentially we can pull from either side of the, the centrifugation, the central cult unit from the inside or the outside wall. We can pull buffer off so we can remove different fractions and redesign others. Um, if you want to see what's happening, essentially how the system is doing an automated fly call, it has a layer detection camera. And what's happening is shown here at the bottom. And again, I'll draw you these little arrows so you can see. Um, essentially, I'm drawing an arrow so that what's resolved is the PDMC layer. Um, the system spins, and then the camera turns on, and it looks for different layers. And uh, it, can, it, it knows the, the densities and it calculates them. So on the outside here, on the far right are the erythrocytes and the granocytes, and then you have the spike hole layer, and then you have this thin layer, that's the PPMC, plasma, and buffer. And the system is calculating whether to pull from the inside or the outside wall of the, the, the um, centrical unit while it's still spinning uh, the volumes it needs to pull so that it can leave behind just the PPMC layer when it's doing the spike hole. These would then go forward and do some platelet washing, and at the end of that process, we would have uh, PPMCs. Uh, similar to what you would make manually by doing the fly call yourself. Um, so um, we're going to talk about leveraging the Prodigy to do rare cell isolation. And a really classic example that we've dealt with several customers on um, to help them scale up their sorting is regulatory T cells. So human regulatory T cells exist at a frequency of about 1% in PPMCs. So getting enough of them is always a challenge. And so we've had, we've worked with several customers now on leveraging the Prodigy system to scale up their sorting of these cell types so they have enough to do their assays. 
So before we talk about how we've done that scale up, it's useful to understand how we sort uh, regulatory T cells using max technology. So the first step is we do a depletion of non-CD4 cells. So we have this uh, biotelia cocktail of antibodies that labels non-CD4 cells and anti-biotin D that um, label in a two-section, a two-step labeling reaction. And we pass that through a column, uh, and the flow through of that column are enriched CD4 T cells, which you can kind of see the result of what those look like from this kit was where I'm drawing the, the marker now. Uh, you can see these are the, the enriched CD4 T cells. Um, and then in the next step, we take the, that uh, pre-enriched CD4 T cells and we now label them with CD25 uh, microbeads. So CD25 is uh, expressed on uh, regulatory T cells. It can also be expressed, expressed on other activated T cell populations, but um, it can be used as an enrichment technology to enrich and purify uh, regulatory T cells. So we label them with CD25 microbeads. We do a positive selection through the column and then we'll leave the positive population. And you can see that the uh, isolated Tregs have this CD4, a positive CD25 phenotype that we would expect from regulatory T cells. Um, okay, so moving forward, um, if we look back a few years before we started doing this work and we take someone who had an automax pro and they wanted to get as many regulatory T cells as possible, what would be their workflow and what would their day look like using traditional sort of max technology? So they would probably get in a Luca pack, um, again, of about 10 billion cells, and they would do their standard FI call, which would take them 90 minutes. Uh, and then they would uh, start their depletion bead labeling. So they'd pipe out the bead cocktail on. Um, it'd take 15 minutes to then purify these, or pre enrich the CD4 T cell population. If they were leveraging an Automax Pro, really the maximum number of cells they could process in that Automax Pro in a single run or a single day, by my calculations, is about 1.4 billion cells. So even though they had 10 billion cells, not all 10 billion cells are getting labeled and processed on day one. Um, it's not really possible. And the actual depletion of that across an Automax Pro for those 1.4 billion cells would take us about four hours. So it's a really big bottleneck in the assay. The pro is just not fast enough. This depletion has to be run really slow and stringently to get a good CD4 purity. Um, and because of that, and the, the design of the pro and the starting number of cells is still pretty high and outside that kind of normal max range, it takes a while. And then we do a cell wash, uh, the bead labeling, again, this is a manual bead labeling where we're doing CD25 bead labeling, another cell wash. And now we go back to our Automax Pro and we do that CD25 positive selection. And that takes us about 20 minutes. And then we do a cell wash. And then finally, we're ready to start our downstream assay. You know, we're going to do flow, we're going to do cell culture, or whatever we're going to do with those cells that day. But the problem is we spent seven hours getting the, the Tregs, which are probably you know not more than a few million Tregs um, from uh, only 1.4 billion cells. And we've had three hours of hands-on time, and it's the end of the day because our leukopact didn't come in until 10 a.m. So we're not getting our cells till 5. And I still need to do all the other work I have to do, so I'm going home late tonight. So, um, and even at this long day, our scale isn't really what we'd like to be at. We'd really like to be processing all the back. And so what we worked with, with these customers who had this workflow on was really leveraging the Prodigy to, to change both the scale and the time. So now we are going to work at a full Lucapack scale. So we're going to take that total 10 billion uh, total nucleated cells and process it all in one run. So the whole Lucapack is going to get run. Again, the work that we need to do, the main work we need to do is setting up the Prodigy. So we have to get the Prodigy tubing set and that Lucapack connected onto the system. And then we press go. And once we press go, something really magical happens. It's essentially automated cell processing. So all those steps that were manual steps for us that were time sync took lots of time for us to process those cells and at an even lower scale than we were running before, start to happen completely automated. So everything happens without us having to be there, without us having to do anything. And it's uh, really great uh, for people who are doing Tregs. And our total time is an hour and a half or so faster than, and our scale is eight to tenfold higher than what it would have been on an Automax. And our hands-on time is, is you know, tenfold less as well. So ultimately, this is a much better and much more uh, implementable system for people doing regulatory T cell work than the alternatives um, that uh, were available before. Um, and so this has been really great for people who are doing this work routinely. So 
Can we kind of take another example and look at uh, a common workflow and could we even expand on the amount of automation we could use and how we could leverage the Prodigy's automation capabilities even further? We can look at generating automated uh, monocyte drive dendritic cells on the Prodigy. So we're going to fully automate this process. So the process starts very similarly to what we discussed for with regulatory T cells. Um, we're going to do the processing of the apheresis product. We're going to get back. Um, we're going to have several washing and centrifugation steps to get it ready. So basically, to make PBMCs. We're, we have a simpler sorting procedure now because we're just going to do direct selection of monocytes by labeling with CD14 microbeads. Um, and so we're just purifying uh, monocytes based off their expression of CD14. Once we have those purified uh, monocytes, we can differentiate them towards uh, the dendritic cell lineage by um, culturing them in certain media and cytokine mix that uh, happens in the centricult unit, which is in this little graph called the cell culture chamber uh, down here where I'm drawing the arrow. So this is, again, kind of a, a picture of the centricult unit. And the cells are seeded into the centricult unit and maintained there across the, say, one week period of them being differentiated into DCs. And then finally, at the end of the process, we can do we can get the cells out of the centricult unit, we can wash them, uh, sample them, do some final product formulation, and uh, move on with our assay. And so this, this whole, let's say, one week process is completely contained and automated within the audit. Chronomatch Prodigy. So uh, the initial monocyte purity after the selection is high, so CD14 selection for monocyte works really, really well, and it's about 96% pure, and we get about 85% of the total uh, monocytes present that we seed into the culture. And we looked at this and compared this versus the cell culture chamber, which is the centricult unit. Okay, so the left graph here, and again, I'll draw a little arrow here. So the, this is the centricult unit, this one. And then the bag is kind of a similar scale to the centricult unit, large scale on differentiation monocytes uh, into dendritic cells. And then the six well protocol, which is a very standard research scale protocol. And what you can see that is in terms of both recovery and viability, um, the generation of, of dendritic cells was identical to the sort of comparative method of bag based or six well differentiation in, when using the centricult unit. Uh, and I'm not going to show the data just because of timing requirements, but we, of course, did pull immunophenotyping of the cells to ensure that their phenotype was consistent with the fact that they were uh, no DCs. Um, and so if you uh, are worried about that, we can certainly show the data that you can just send us a note. Um, and so you can see that you can automate these really complex assays um, with the prodigy, including cell cultivation of, of routine cell types. And so to kind of sum up the prodigy section, we can run these whole Luca packs and do lots of different things with them. So it can be as simple as volume reduction and media exchanges, which only take you know, maybe 10 minutes to wash the cells. And then automate if I call, you know, for customers who are using their Prodigy systems just for uh, the generation of PPMCs uh, from Luca packs, so they're not doing cell selection all the time. They're sometimes just taking Luca pack and making PPMCs and cryopreserving them. It probably takes a little more than an hour. And then we have platelet washes. Um, some of the leukophoresis products have relatively low RBC content and low granulocyte content. And because of that, um, we don't actually need a full by call procedure to process them to purify cells. We can just do platelet washing and then direct max based cell sorting. And so if that's the case, we save some time from having to do the by call and this only takes about 30 minutes. So depending on the, the different products that are out there in the market space in terms of the leukopacks and the different vendors that supply leukopacks, automated by call or the plate the wash plus the magnetic bead sorting is taking between say three to six hours depending on the cell type. The more complex the procedure, the longer it takes. So the T-Rex being kind of the longest procedure. Um, and then those cell purification plus expansion of cells like I showed in the ODC, that can be you know between six hours of cultivation time up to two weeks um, or even more. And it's really just dependent upon your needs. So again, you can really do anything that you would potentially need to. So if you have specific applications I haven't discussed, definitely reach out to us and we're happy to discuss them. And we have plenty of uh, experience uh, supporting these applications and helping customers get things up and running on the prodigies and automated. So moving on um, to kind of another um, platform. Um, this next section um, is doing uh, kind of, instead of having one really big sample, now we're thinking about, well, I have a lot of samples coming into my lab and I can't really process purified cells fast enough. So I have 20 or 40 or 60 samples that I need to process all at once. It could be human blood from patients uh, on clinical trials. It could be different uh, tissues from uh, mouse or animal models. 
And because of the number of samples I have, I just can't get my work done. And so we developed this Multimax X instrument. And then we'll take a specific example here and look at the isolation of mouse tail uh, before we move to kind of our case study example. So before uh, we could divine, design an automated instrument, we really needed a better manual max sorter for multiplex uh, sorting. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we developed this Multimax L24 instrument. Um, it's a manual device um, that allows us to process between one and 24 samples in parallel with run times of less than an hour. It can be between 30 minutes and an hour, depending on the cell type you're trying to isolate. Um, and it uses these uh, fused blocks of columns um, that are 24 columns that are all fused together. They have a sort of 24 well format. And also, we developed this vacuum elution technology. So where I'm drawing the arrow is, this is the vacuum station. So it's generating the vacuum. So it's generating a pre-vacuum. And also, there is the vacuum chamber where the block is placed. So the block of columns where I'm drawing the arrow now is placed into this vacuum chamber. And the cells are um, basically sucked off the column by vacuum impulse technology. So they are, instead of having to do this plunger, because if you had 24 samples and you had to do plungering or other things, it would kind of negate the speed advantages of doing this multiplex sorting. So we've developed a different elution technology. And then finally, because this is a manual use device, it's really easy to use. It has fast setup and low training requirements. So you can use it in almost any environment. Um, most of my trainings for Multimax X's for custom, I mean, for Multimaxes are between five and 15 minutes, depending on your application. So you can really get up and running these, these systems quite fast. So we had many customers start using this for their various applications, and I think the natural evolution for them was like, we like the Multimax, but we really like to have uh, a Multimax that's more like an Automax so that it's automated um, to do cell selection. And so we kind of listened to that, and we talked to people in the market who had needs for these things. And so in the last 18 months, uh, we've developed this new system called the Multimax X, which is the automated version of the Multimax L24. Um, and it really sort of, it serves all sort of high throughput magnetic cell separation needs. So the example we'll use today is really parallel processing of up to 24 samples per run. So we have 24 individual samples we want to process. The system can also bulk process uh, larger cell products um, up to about the half nucleotide scale using all 24 columns for a single uh, sample. And unfortunately, just because of timing requirements, um, I'm not going to be able to get to that. Sorry. Um, we can run positive uh, and untouched isolation strategies using all of our different reagents. You can start with all different types of cell starting materials, so you know, blood based materials, bone marrow, fluffy coats, nucleotides. Uh, purified PBMCs, and then the example we'll use later is dissociated tissues, and in our case, dissociated tumors. Um, we have customers in the immunology, cancer, and stem cell world that are all, all using these, these systems successfully. Um, and uh, there is, um, based off the software, uh, reagent and sample tracking uh, and documentation available. So if you have needs for you know, batch records or things like that, or integration into these LEM systems, that's all possible you do in the system. So if we look kind of inside the system, so take the housing away and kind of look inside what's what what's inside the Multimax X. So again, we have the Multimax Cell 24 separator unit. It looks pretty much identical uh, to the manual device. It's slightly modified, but it's it's very similar. We again have that vacuum station that we talked about before, and then there's basically a, a hose that runs underneath the deck uh, to the to the elution chamber, where again we'll we'll use that vacuum impulse to elute the samples off the column. And then over here on the left-hand side of the system, we have our sample racks. Uh, and these are chill racks and our uh, reagent racks. So all the samples and reagents are kept cold. We can use 5 mil tubes, 15 mil tubes, 15 mil conicals. Um, so really a lot of flexibility on what type of uh, sample container you want to use for your run based off your samples. Uh, and then we have uh, buffer troughs. So that keeps all the buffer, the PBS-based buffers we're going to use the actual, to do the actual sort. Uh, disposable tips and the columns, and then we have these storage hotels in the back where we keep more depot plates, more tips, uh, and racks and things that, uh, in case the robot runs out of the ones that it's using, like if it runs out of a particular tip, it will just go get more tips from the hotels and continue to run so it doesn't stop and ask the operator for more tips, it just goes and gets them themselves. Um, one of the real challenges with building a system like this, where you built it into a fluid handling is you could do this yourself with other commercial technologies like TKN or Hamilton, but um, every time you want to change the programming or the 
technology of programming, you have to write new scripts, and the software is, is pretty hard to use, and you have to kind of be a, an automation expert to do that. You have none of those challenges with the system. So essentially, it's a dedicated cell sorter. Um, you would open up the script for your given application. Um, this is the script we'll use uh, for the till selection that we'll talk about in just a second, for isolating till from tumors. And it just tells you which column block you're using, that you're using these 24 fused columns. Your sample container, you want to put your tubes in 15 mil conicals. And then your number of samples, your sample volume, and your cell count, these are fields we can enter them in. Um, you can either put, if they're all the same, you can enter them in just these fields. If you need a, cell, a different cell count for each sample individually, you can click the little uh, radio button over here uh, on the side uh, when I'm drawing this arrow, and uh, you can enter those. Another screen will pop up and you can enter those. You can assign sample IDs, so you can assign individual sample IDs to different uh, um, uh, samples if you want to do that, and then you can change the wash timers um, for different things if you want to wash slower or faster than our standard recommendations. So you have a lot of flexibility. And then at the end of that process, you're just hitting the play button and the end board, uh, and your run is happening. So um, the system itself uh, is just enabling you to do lots of different cell selections for lots of samples, but you can expand its options and, and automate assays even further by um, integrating additional external robotics. So there is a port in the back of the system that allows you to transfer uh, this, the isolated cell populations to another robot. So um, you could actually put the samples out into another robot. Um, this would probably be most useful if you had automated cell culture robots and you needed primary cells to be seeded into them. Um, and then uh, the other option would be the integration of a flow cytometer on the side of the system, which this is a picture of our max quant system integrated into the uh, Multimax X. And you can see that it's actually uh, the Multimax X, the, the max quant uh, auto, auto sampler is reaching into where I'm drawing this. Uh, uh, red arrow now, it's reaching into the deck of the Multimax X to accept uh, uh, samples from the Multimax X and then it'll come over and do automated QC or phenotypic analysis of those purified populations. So you can fully automate both the cell isolation and also phenotypic analysis or QC of samples using uh, integrated uh, flow cytometry capabilities so you can automate full assays here. Um, so the example I'll use to kind of show the utility of the system are something that we've been working with some of our customers on, which is the enrichment of these uh, tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes, which are quite interesting in lots of immune oncology applications, and then these mouse and genetic tumor models. So syngenetic tumor models are mouse tumors in mice, um, so they're not you know, human tissue being grafted into mouse or something like that. Um, Okay, so the, the workflow we use for syngenetic tumors at Multeni, so how we actually process these things, is we start with a mouse tumor that we, re we resected and removed from a mouse tumor. Um, we dissociate it using one of our Gelomax systems that has, uh, along with an enzyme mix, which we call a tumor dissociation to the mouse. And then at the end of that, we get single cell suspension, and we have to make a single cell suspension so that then we can uh, do cell isolation of individual cell populations, and in this case, the till population. And we do this with our till isolation kit mouse. Um, till isolation kit mouse is based off of CD45 selection of uh, infiltrating cells. So all white cells in the mouse immune system will express CD45. So it's a pan enrichment of all the immune cells that might be in the tumor microenvironment. This gives us isolated tills. Um, and then those isolated tills can be uh, analyzed by immunophenotyping in our example. Uh, many customers are doing a similar workflow, but they're not including this till selection step. They're just associating the material and going directly to uh, the till subpopulation analysis. So we'll kind of discuss the value proposition on why customers are interested in adding this till selection step in tuners and, and what does that mean for them and why, why is it useful to add to, it, it seems a little counterintuitive sometimes to add an additional step when you could just have a direct read of your till after the association. So we'll kind of discuss that uh, in, in some detail about why you want to do that. The other thing is if we add this extra step, one of the big concerns most people have is, is how fast is it? How much work can I get done with a given person's time? And so this is really a, a graph that we put together in a study we did in-house where we took 24 uh, mouse tumors and processed them uh, it's through the whole the whole workflow, essentially the whole multi prep, uh, and 
only used one uh, FTE or one technician's time to do the work. And so the first hour of that person's day was really resecting those 24 mouse tumors um, and getting them in the enzyme mix and the gentle max tubes. And so they were able to get all 24 tumors out in an hour. And then we have this green arrow that shows that the process is automated. So we take three gentle max octos with heaters and we snap on 24 tubes and we run these association runs all at once. And in 40 minutes, we have single cell suspension. Then that technician does some filter washing, spinning, and, and then resuspension of the sample to get it ready to load onto the Multimax X. And then again, we have this green arrow where the cell selection of the till enrichment happens fully automated um, on the Multimax X. So with a single person in about three hours of time, you can enrich a good by till. So it's, it's really quite fast, and really all you're adding is about an hour of additional work for the cell separation stuff. So We'll kind of return to this idea of, well, I could directly read my tumor, my till directly off my dissociated uh, material. Why would I do till enrichment? And so it kind of comes back to two points. One is it reduces your time to data. So it takes less time to do the flow analysis or the flow phenotyping in enriched samples versus unenriched samples. And there's also this idea of improving as assay sensitivity. So your, your uh, signal to noise ratio is better in enriched samples than it's in unenriched samples. So in an unrich samples, we can calculate a time of ac sample acquisition in minutes by a really simple formula. And again, this is kind of ideal world calculation. So we can take our till acquisition target for how many tills do we actually want to acquire when we run our first tumor. And in all the examples I'll use is that we want at least 100,000 CD45 positive till events uh, in our data set. We divide that by the till frequency. So how abundant are the till in the dissociated tumor? Is 1% of the total cellular mass of the tumor till or is it 10%? 20%, 40%. And then our acquisition rate is how many events per second our cytometer runs at. And if we take that expression and then divide it by 60 seconds, we return a time of acquisition in minutes. So we can look at this in just kind of a, a basic grid of, of timing. And where you can see that the really key thing is here is that the, the lower the tilt frequency, so at a 1% tilt frequency, our run times are all much longer than they would be without it. So you can see that this line here is where the tilt frequency for this line is all 1%, is much, much slower than when our tilt frequency is 40%, right? So when we have more targets, we acquire our data faster. And the only and the only way to decrease the time of acquisition is to speed up the actual acquisition rate, which is given along this top line here. So this is saying we're either acquiring 1,000 events per second or 10,000 events per second. And this graph that I've got here that I've kind of annotated is just telling you your time of acquisition for a single data file. And so in our enriched samples, if your tilt frequency is really low and you need 100,000 events, it can take you a really long time, even at fast acquisition rates, to acquire a single sample. So it might take you 15 or 16 minutes in a 1% tilt frequency to acquire. And there are mouse models that exist with tilt frequencies this low. So the B16 Colonello model is a classic example of a, a, of a low sort of till model that doesn't have a lot of till in it. So analyzing these can be really quite challenging, and lots of people kind of shy away from them. We can kind of dramatically change both the timing and the assay sensitivity by doing enrichments. So we can change this sort of mathematical relationship by now applying this enrichment factor. So uh, essentially, it's the same mathematical equation, but now we're, we're multiplying uh, the denominator by this additional factor, which we call this enrichment factor, which is what happens when we do the B enrichment. And this is just empirically determined. So the enrichment factors um, are just uh, what is the fold uh, purification of the material versus the parent? So if the purity goes from 1% to 80%, which would be kind of what we're showing in this first line, we'd have an 80-fold enrichment factor uh, for that sample. And these enrichment factors, again, are sort of empirically determined from our experience in different tumor models. You know, we know that B16 tumors, we average getting about 80% purity, so our enrichment factor is about 80. So now when we look at this, uh, the timing acquisition is, is really clusters around because um, we've, we've essentially arranged them all to being roughly the same purity. They're all 80 to 90 percent pure but till. And so the acquisition time is really now only dependent on the acquisition rate of the cytometer. Um, and it's not really dependent on the model we use. So it's really nice in the sense that all of our models run in the same amount of time. But probably even more key than that is that this enrichment factor sets what's our relative improvement in assay sensitivity. So what is our signal to noise ratio? So even in these abundant models, 
um, we have a twofold increase in our signal to noise ratio. And in abundant models, maybe all the till is 40%, but 80% of the till could be myeloid lineage. And if you're you know, developing a T cell therapeutic and are really interested in T cell responses, and T cells are only five or 10% of this 40%, then you still have rare cells. So this enrichment by till can really help with assay sensitivity. So um, again, the idea of decreasing the time of acquisition makes your day a little bit shorter, but it's really this enrichment factor and improvement in getting better data that, that really is the driving factor between adding this or adding this till enrichment in my opinion. Um, so we can look at a couple different models and just look at some very basic parameters. So this is just looking at CD45 expression on these tumors. Um, so we have CD45 in the Y and we have a counter stain against our bead in the X direction. So Populations, because it's a CD45 bead, should be double positive, and that's how they look. CD26 is a, um, a colon tumor. It has about 20% CD45 positive cells after dissociation. Uh, the B16 tumor here in the middle is that rare cell type. It only has about 1% till. And the 4T1 is a breast model, uh, breast tumor model that accumulates more till, and so it's about 40%. So what you can see is after we apply the enrichment, so we do the selection of CD45 positives, you can see that now these are all kind of clustering around 80 to 90 percent purity. And certainly for the V16 model in the middle, middle, you can see how many more events you're really getting. And also for all the models, you can see that you have less uh, non-CD45 positive cells. So the double negative population is a lot smaller. And that's really saying that you're accumulating more events you care about because you actually want to phenotype you know, this upper population of till you don't really care about this double negative population in the bottom. Um, and so you're, you're having better uh, population statistics and also less acquisition time. So uh, just looking at some, some sort of uh, actual metrics, you can see the initial frequencies of the different lines, uh, the purities we enrich them to, they're generally better than 80% across all these lines. And then the, the yields are between 60 and 80%, which is consistent with what I would expect for most max cell selection, uh, even in the mean lineage populations. So the, the technology definitely works quite well and, and enables this ability to enrich till and get better population statistics. So if we look at kind of returning to that, is it worthwhile to do? Um, basically, certainly in rare cell models like B16 where tills poorly accumulate doing this enrichment definitely makes sense. So if we had 24 samples that we wanted to run and it took us uh, down here for the time for the unenriched till, which is, I'll draw a map, uh, this, this part right here, um, it's going to take us over six and a half hours to run 24 samples because even if we run our cytometer at 10,000 minutes per second, um, it's going to take us 16 minutes per sample. And there's the additional caveat is that we may never actually get to 100,000 until because we might run out of sample or we might get so many events in our data file that the cytometer can't actually acquire any more events, so it stops acquisitions because it can't, it can't save a file that big, uh, which can also happen with these. But we can really dramatically change that timing for the enriched analysis by using these, these till technologies to uh, enrich the till. And now our time of analysis is maybe 50 to 60 minutes because um, we're only spending you know, 15 or 20 seconds per sample uh, running the tills um, you know, using that sort of mathematical formula in an optimal world and then 45 minute pre-enrichment using the Morgan XX. So uh, definitely for rare cell models, this till enrichment makes a lot of sense. Um, and it can make sense even for more abundant targets, depending on the cell type you are interested in. And, and it's a really useful and powerful new tool. Um, okay, so in the last few minutes here, I'm just going to kind of uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about our new 384 well the Macroquant X. And then in the last slide, I kind of talk about assay miniaturization and making uh, drug screening more realistic using the iterative workflow. And then I can take questions. All right, so the MaxQuant X is a high throughput cytometer. Um, it supports high throughput screening. Um, so you can run lots of different plates in the 3D4 last way for actual screening activities. But it's really flexible and easy to use. And because of its design, it can run a single tube, it can run 24 back tubes, it can run a 96 volt plate, a 384 volt plate. It can really support any assay in any scale. So you don't only have to think of the X as a as a screening device, it can really just be a standard cytometer that happens to be really fast. Um, the system itself is fully automated, so it'll run fully automated assays, including labeling. It has a, a three laser optical bench with a 405 nanometer, 488, and 633 nanometer lasers. 
there's eight fluorescent channels plus four inside scatter, so it's 10 total parameters. Um, and so it's, and it's got a very small footprint. Um, the real advantage of the X versus our traditional uh, platforms is speed. So it'll run a 96 well plate in only 15 minutes and a 384 well plate in 60 minutes. Um, so even if you're just running your assays in 96 well plates and you have three or four, it's really nice to get done in an hour for the work that it would, you know, maybe take two or three hours using more traditional cytometry platforms. Additionally, um, again, the system is very flexible and it has a lot of automation. So it has two different shaking mechanisms depending on whether it's running larger volumes of uh, using fax tubes. It, it has a different mag mixing mechanism than if it's running small volumes of the 96 volt plates or 384 plates, which again really extends the capability for it to be you know, an everyday usage cytometer. Um, the auto labeling function here is, is really nice. It will label with antibodies or dyes or anything that you want into 96 volt plates and 384 well plates. Uh, and for 3D well pro plates, this auto labeling capability is really critical because pipetting to a 3D4 well plate without robotics is, is really quite challenging. The potential to miss wells is, is high uh, unless you have uh, some, some help from automation or, or, or specific pipettes. Um, and then the system itself is designed and ready made for integration for external liquid handling uh, systems like the Multimax X um, or other robotic platforms or just plate hotels. So, and my final kind of final slide is that you can um, take the Multimax X um, and really miniaturize your assay. Um, and lots of people have been miniaturizing primary cell assays for flow down into sort of uh, 96 well format uh, pretty routinely. And the idea here is that if you're at 96 wells, you, know, you probably have 100 to 200 microliters of, of, of media or buffer in your well. And if you're doing some drug reaction or screening or whatever, that means you're going to use less antibody reagents and drug compound. But now if we go to the 384 well plate, uh, we have probably another tenfold reduction. So we're at maybe 10 to 20 microliters total reaction volume. And now by doing that miniaturization, we're consuming lots of those primary cells that we worked so hard previously to sort of generate maybe from a leak back or otherwise. So we're getting more bang uh, for our buck while it's generally similar data sets. And then additionally, because the, the max quant X is really fast, even though we're moving into this high you know, 384 well plate, um, we can, we can uh, automate it and run the, the assay in about 60 minutes. And then finally, uh, the, the, the max quant X includes some really great software tools, which again, unfortunately, I'm not going really to talk about, to help you deal with all the data you would generate from these 384 well plates, to analyze them quickly via heat maps and try to you know, sort of digest data quickly. And that capability is even extended even further by this FlowLogic software, which we're distributing, which handles very large data sets uh, very well and has lots of uh, options for uh, data analysis for these, these big data sets. And so you kind of put all this together. Uh, it's really nice. And then if you're, the scale of your assay really is big and you're going to have a multi-plate assay and you want to automate it even more, you can hook up external robotics like these plate loaders like the side of me, so the, uh, things like that from Thurman Fisher, and have plates loaded onto the system continuously. So if you needed to process you know, 20, 30, 40 well plates a day, um, you could do that type of work uh, and have it mostly automated. And so that's kind of the end of my discussion of these different technologies, and I hope it was useful. So um, I appreciate your uh, time and attention, and I can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Trotter Mayo, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. The first question is, you alluded to the capabilities of the Multimax X to process larger cell numbers, but didn't really give examples. Can you expand on that and also compare the Multimax X's capabilities with that of the Prodigy? That's a really good question, um, and it's something we are talking to lots of customers about. Um, there's sort of a natural curiosity about which platform is the best. 
I would say that if your primary goal is really processing large cell products like Lucapax, and that is really what you're going to do most of the time, the Prodigy is a better fit um, because it works at the sort of whole Lucapax scale. So it gets out to that 10, 20 billion cell range. What we've seen with the Multimax X when we use it for large cell processing is that we probably have less capabilities in terms of the total cell number we can process in a given unit of time. And also, um, there's a little bit less automation because we may need to make do, have you do fly call or other things. So the kind of the take home from that is that we can really process on the Multimax X probably half Lucapax, so something around two to five billion cells, um, but we're not at the full Lucapax scale. Um, and we may or may not need the fly call depending on the cell type that you need. We have some technologies where we can directly select cells for on the Multimax X without doing fly call. Um, but it's not something that we can assure you, whereas the ability of the Prodigy to always do fly call um, really opens up our entire portfolio of products. So um, they're both very useful tools in the space, and I think that's really where, you know, if you have applications, it's really useful to talk to us about them, and we can kind of help you for your specific application understand which instrument might be a better fit. Great, thank you. Next question is, can you provide a little more detail on the integration of your flow cytometers into the Multimax X or other external robotics platforms? Yeah, um, another thing that I just didn't really get to spend a lot of time on because of time requirements. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So the, the quant, our system is designed really to integrate to external robotics. It was effectively designed that way. So it's pretty easy for us to park it on the left-hand side of the instrument. The uh, applications that customers are interested in using it for are pretty wide-ranging. Um, we have customers who really are just wanting to use it to QC their sample, so kind of an identity test um, after they've done their cell selection. Um, and an example of this is, say, um, you're sorting T cells from, from humans cell populations that you're going to adopt to the transfer into mice because you're humanizing mice or you're, you're doing some therapy where you want to put these cells into the mouse. Um, you can have it count because the, the quants are also counting. Uh, it can count the cell population and also determine the purity of the T cells after the cell selection. Um, so your technician or whoever's going to do the injection can just directly go ahead. They don't have to do an additional step of counting the cells and determining the purity and then calculating everything and then going to the right there into the injections. So for the quant, it's it's really straightforward in terms of its integration to the multi X and it's something that, you know, it's more based on more needs from an application perspective of, of an example of what you want to do. For other external robotic systems, um, it's really, again, getting into really your needs in terms of the specific application you want to run and why you have another robot that you want system to interact with. And that's really where sort of our automation experience and our automation teams, we have a dedicated sort of automation team and application team for the Multimax X who deal with these more complex issues, gets involved and really helps customers with these specific challenges that they face and their specific assays. So it's kind of hard for me to specifically comment on those, but I think the key point is to come to us with those needs and we'll do our best to support you. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and that question is, you didn't provide any details on the GentleMax platforms that are used to generate single cell suspensions from the mouse tumors. Can you provide ad additional details of how this technology works? Yeah. Um, so this technology has been out for, I would say, six or eight years, maybe. Um, it's a tube-based technology where the um, tissue along with an enzyme mix is placed into a tube. And that tube has a, it's a little hard to visualize, but it has a, uh, a cap that is, is sealed on top of it. It has a rotor and a stator. So a fixed set of teeth and a rotor that spins around those teeth. And based on how fast we spin that rotor and the direction in which we spin it, we can define sort of a mechanical force profile. So how much mechanical force are we exerting on a piece of tissue at a given point in its dissociation process such that um, we can optimize that force profile so that it's really the best possible force for um, your given tissue. 
So historically, when people have done this, they've used enzymes, which we're still using. So we still have enzymes in our tubes. So there's times where the enzymes are working, and there's times where it's already a mechanical force using this rotor and stator system. Um, but your hand, you know, and a mortar and a pestle or a filter and a the top of a five mil um, syringe, um, you can't really control how much force you're generating across the tissue. And so the ability to sort of fine tune that force and use automation uh, to better uh, associate tissues has really opened up the opportunity to do more primary cell work with complex tissues and also have better products at the end of that uh, and better single cell suspensions, which are really useful not only for the max technology, but really for all downstream assays. So kind of again, coming back to if you have these needs and you're struggling with tissue dissociation uh, in any given real tissue, definitely I would like to once again thank Dr. Trotter Mayo for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots and Miltigny Biotech for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 24, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.